Hello there, and welcome to the next installment of Fragments of Infinity, colon, What They Didn't Teach You in Music School. And uh, before we get started, probably the first noticeable thing is that I'm wearing these kind of dorky 99 cent store reading glasses. And yes, I have to uh, wear them in this video because I'm checking uh, the notes on my laptop every once in a while to make this uh, a more pleasing experience for y'all. Now, before I begin, and the beginning here is the real beginning. Well, this is the very first step in the series, the steps of logic I use for getting through um, understanding music theory from my perspective. Uh, but before we actually embark on that journey, I'd like to explain why fragments of infinity and why uh, what they didn't teach you in music school. All right, Fragments of Infinity, it came to me one day that, that um, out of infinity, if you look at infinite space, out of that infinite space came finite fragments uh, like planets, stars, comets, meteors, that sort of thing, arose from this apparent nothingness of space. So I thought about music, too, as being infinite in the sense that in two dimensions, music is a circle. You go do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, and you come back to do. So it proceeds in a circle, all right? And a circle can have an infinite number of points. Now, I'm speaking of, a, of music in two dimensions. Music in three dimensions, you'd have to picture a spiral because you start at do, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, and now you're a level up because you're a higher octave up, and so on and so forth. Each time you repeat that scale, you're a higher octave, higher octave. Now, the fact of it being a spiral to me is really interesting. If you've learned anything about the Fibonacci series, nature tends to create uh, spirals through mathematical ratios. And uh, this is one of the reasons why I say music is the hidden mathematics of nature. Uh, I think it follows natural laws and there's a big secret to be found in music that we haven't discovered in this present contemporary, contemporary humanity of ours. Um, so, all right, so you have a circle. And that would be from do to do, the octave, okay? Within that circle, you could split it up as many points as you want, infinitely, an infinite amount of points. Um, now, in our system, we split that circle up into 12, the 12 notes of the chromatic scale. And it proceeds similarly as the do re mi scale, except now you have all the notes, and you wind up coming back up to do again. Uh, we have 12, but if you look at the Turkish system, they have uh, uh, 22 notes. They split up the octave into 22 notes, which means they're utilizing blue notes blue notes. <laughs> they're util utilizing microtones, probably have a few blue notes in there, but they're using microtones. The reason why blue notes came to mind is because when you play a blue note, you kind of bend it a little. So it's not either like, for example, an E flat or an E. It's somewhere in between there, the shady area. Um, anyway, uh, we split the circle into 12 notes, and now we have 12 finite pieces that we call the chromatic scale. Uh, by the way, in my theory, I don't consider the chromatic scale to be a scale. The chromatic scale is the genetic pool from which we create forms. In a sense, we're, when we deal with musical materials, we're like an analogy of God. You know, you have this genetic pool and you zap it with something and out, out of it comes life in its various forms. So that's why fragments of infinity, something that arises from apparently nothing out of infinity. All right, now why what they didn't teach you in music school? Uh, I have a long history of teaching. I started when I was 20 years old. My first student was 16 years old. And over the course of time, uh, I realized, like, I, I studied music theory at a young age. I mean, I was getting into it by the time I was 17. I had books on classical composition and orchestration and all this stuff I wanted to know. So, uh, as I progressed through time, back in the early 90s, I had, actually the late 90s, I moved down to Austin, Texas. I desperately needed a job, and I went to the Austin Guitar School 
to see if they needed a teacher and lo and behold they hired me and it was really interesting because I got a lot of um, uh, it's kind of a derogatory term hack guitar players I don't want to call them that they were genuine songwriters they just didn't have a lot of experience and knowledge and uh, it was really interesting because a lot of these guys said to me Vinny how do I go out go about writing music how do, how do I go about writing a song and I tell them well there's two ways I mean you could either go about it intuitively intuitively if you have good instincts like say Wes Montgomery who didn't know the names of the chords and scales he was playing but yet he was a master uh, you could go about it intuitively or you can learn music theory to understand it in a rational way uh, and bear in mind, you know, uh, if you have the gift, just make music. Don't worry too much about the theory. The, the ultimate thing about the music is the experience you're having with it. Um, Paul McCartney had music theory in his bones, his blood and bones is a, a saying of mine. Oh, he has music theory in his blood and bones. Basically that, uh, you know, that you can write according to music theory principles, but it just sounds right to them. They don't know the whys and wherefores. However, if you're not that lucky, if you're not that fortunate to have been born with that gift of just getting music, you just get it, music theory can fill in all those gaps, okay? And, you know, 90% of the time, that's most people, including myself. I, I had to learn the theory. I wasn't um, intuitive like that. Uh, so in any case, I realized that music theory is relegated to either sophisticated jazz playing like improv or classical composition. In those two areas, you really, really, really need uh, music theory. And here I got these guys that are just basic singer-songwriters. So I had to figure out a way to see if it was possible to simplify music theory. So I was very creative, you know, I've always been the creative type, so I'd figure out new perspectives, new maps, new ways to look at things. Until, up till now, I have a complete vocabulary, and I realized in the course of teaching, I would try to clarify a concept, and i go, wait a second, you know, this is true here, but it's not true there, and they never showed that to me in music school. For example, we'll get into this, but in the modern major minor key system, uh, a key is a root. In the Greek mode system, a key is a neutral series of tones that you could make a root out of one of those tones. And I'll really, you know, get into that specifically later on down the line. But yeah, I had to develop a way to, to express these concepts. And in the course of things, I made a ton of discoveries. And I want to share those discoveries. And it's very important to me that these ideas get out in the wild and perhaps some academic will look at it and say, you know what, he's got a point there. Let's, let's see if we could clarify this a bit. So that's that. That's why uh, what they didn't teach you in music school. I'm not being snobby when they say that, and God knows I don't want to go head to head with an academic because uh, one thing I can't stand is intellectual argument. Uh, in any case, so let's get, on, let's get on to the main theme here. What I'm going to talk to you about today is the triangle of musical excellence. And uh, it's obviously, it's a very simple, if it's a triangle, it's very simple, three points. But this very simple diagram, it applies to advanced musicians, it applies to beginning musicians, it even applies to different art disciplines aside from music. Um, and it's a way to gauge yourself if you're balanced and your understanding of music and what you're doing musically. All right. So here, let me show you this diagram. And before you go to the top, start down here. It says coordination, which is physical skill, the physical ability to do something. Here we have theory, which is navigating through musical materials. And finally, elocution. I have the word expression. Elocution is the artsy part of music. What is the mysterious thing that makes a phrase beautiful? Uh, what is the mysterious thing that touches so, uh, someone so much that a tear comes to their eye? Or even makes them laugh? All right, these are all the mysteries of music. And you would think that this stuff can't be taught. But I believe all human beings are born with creativity. 
Uh, some people are insecure about expressing themselves, and I have to deal with that uh, in a lot of my teaching situations. But once a person is released, their creativity is released, it's really an amazing thing to see. Um, and that's one of the joys I get from teaching, is to see somebody make that connection and uh, reach a higher level. So let's uh, take a closer look at these now. First of all, there's two ways you could experience this training. One is a linear fashion. You start here at coordination, go to theory, and then end up at expression. The other way is to look at it as one whole thing. And what you want to do, I always tell my students that I want to move these three points ahead at the same time. All right, so if I give them a scale, I'm going to give them the theory on how to apply the scale. Once they can do that, then I give them tips on how to make a statement, how to express yourself in a certain way or the other. So as we focus in further on each point, what if some, a musician was overdeveloped in physical skill? Now let's, let's define physical skill first. Physical skill is um, the ability, like for a guitar, the ability to strum, the ability to form chords, the ability to strum and form chords and move them around at the same time, uh, tap your foot and play at the same time, the ability to physically play a scale to coordinate the pick with uh, the right hand picking with the left hand uh, fretting. This is all a physical thing, all right, and it doesn't require a whole bunch of intellect in order to do it. Uh, how much intellect did it take uh, for you to balance a bicycle, to learn how to balance a bicycle? It's more a feel. You, get, you teach your body to feel what balance feels like. Well, in the same respect, you teach your body, your fingers, in this case, to move in a certain way. Uh, very often when I teach the first pentatonic scale to a student, once I see their, they remember it, just because they intellectually remember it doesn't mean it's remembered yet because it has to be embedded into the muscle memory. I tell them, look, when you're watching TV, just play the scale over and over again, up and down, up and down. You don't have to uh, engage your mind in what you're doing at that point. In fact, I almost encourage it because the, body, the body's own wisdom works great when the mind isn't getting in the way. All right, so um, what do we have when somebody's too developed in this area but not enough here? What you have is a total shredder, somebody who's practiced so hard that they can play super fast. They've coordinated the pick and the left hand and they're just running through it. Uh, Dimebag Darrell, great guitar player, don't get me wrong, but he, he was kind of like that. I saw in an interview, he was a total shredder, but I saw in an interview, uh, he said that he has no idea what scales he's playing when he plays them. So he doesn't have this, he doesn't have the theory, he doesn't understand what he's doing. But there's something in his blood that pushes him to do the things he's doing. That's where the intuitive thing comes in. Um, all right, so you'll get the, the shredder types, or the guys that do all these fancy tapping techniques and all that. This is all physical skill. Now, theory, let's talk about theory for a second. Theory is the navigation through musical materials, all right? And there are three aspects to the use or function of theory, how you would use theory. One is, as a composer, you'd use theory. Um, as an improviser, you would use theory. And in fact, they're really the same thing in a sense. One of my sayings is, composition is slow improvisation, and improvisation is fast composition. Uh, and finally, the third aspect would be analysis. What's the use of analysis? If you, you're given uh, some sheet music and you're looking, you say it's a piece you really love, if you have the principles of theory, you're, you could look at it and go, oh, this chord connects there because this, this, and this, and then you could use that knowledge to enhance your own uh, compositions and songwriting. Uh, somebody who is overly developed here would be a coldly calculating bebop player that is jumping through all these amazing intellectual hoops. In other words, uh, bebop, one of the things they stress was fast modulation and fast uh, chord changes where you have no choice but to change your scale. Uh, of course, that's an incredible skill to develop, but when you, when you emphasize that skill too much, 
you, you're losing other balances, all right? You're losing the balance of expression, for example. Um, there are, I, you know, I once met a piano player who, uh, he tried to flow into the rock field, but he, was, he didn't understand rock. He, he, he played jazz chords and rock songs and it didn't quite fit in. I mean, yeah, you could do it uh, if, if you know what you're doing, if you have enough familiarity with real rock and playing rock and how that feels and the whole expression of it. Um, so yeah, one thing I, I, one of my pet peeves is when somebody says, oh, I only play country guitar or I only play blues guitar or I only play jazz guitar. That's the only thing I really know how to do. And that blows my mind because really you, if you're, one of the things I say, one of the signs of a true pro musician is that he could flow into all the different categories of music. A great musician could do that. There are jazz guys that could do that, guys that uh, toured with Sting, Kenny Kirkland, and uh, rest in peace, and, uh, and Branford Marsalis uh, could play reggae and rock just as easily as they could play jazz. That to me is a sign of a true pro, somebody that can flow into the different um, fields. I'll give you an example, like one time uh, I knew this, I was friends with this uh, funk band, local funk band, I love the guys, They're great guys, I used to go to their parties, lived across the street from them at one time, they had great parties. And of course we became fast friends and they invited me to come jam with them. And I remember uh, I stepped up on stage and I, I didn't know what to play, like I didn't have a song in mind that they might know so I figured, well, let me pick a two chord song and we'll just vamp the two chords and I'll, you know. So uh, I told him, okay, I'm gonna do this song, it's E and A. And the bass player looked at me in panic. And I'm like, just don't worry, man, it's just an E major and an A major. It'll change once every two bars, E two bars, A two bars, E two bars, A two bars. That's all you need to know. He was freaked out. The drummer was also freaked out, like, well, what kind of backbeat do you want for it? Like, these guys did not have flexibility to flow, to be relaxed and flow into a situation. To me, that's not professional. A, a real pro can alter, can be like a chameleon and, and alter his colors to fit in with the colors of the situation he's playing in. All right, so, uh, geez, I lost my train of thought again. So someone who is overdeveloped in elocution, uh, that would be somebody who expresses himself too much. Well, how can that be a bad thing? If you're making a great statement and you're expressing it, that's awesome. So that's why elocution is at the top. Now I'll give you an example uh, of someone who's overdeveloped in, in this without having a lot of that. Uh, for, I once saw the DVD uh, Crossroads Concerts, which is Eric Clapton's, uh, he put together a series of concerts where all these great, great guitar players played there. And John McLaughlin, the illustrious John McLaughlin was there, and he proceeded to play a jazz piece at, I mean, at a million miles an hour, 30 second notes, just streaming. And not only that, but he's going through all these chord changes. And it was mind boggling for about two minutes. And then I was bored. It's like all I'm hearing is a stream of notes and all right, I'm impressed, but reach me, do something, grab my heart. All right, so that's an example of that. I'm not putting John McLaughlin down for your lovers of John McLaughlin. He was awesome. Very, very studied and dedicated musician. Uh, now let's take the reverse situation. Someone who has all this, but none of this. I would use B.B. King as an example of that. He wasn't a big theory guy. Uh, he, he wasn't known for playing jazz and getting through chord changes. He knew his pentatonic scale and a blue note or two. Uh, and he wasn't a speed demon, because really when you're talking about coordination, ultimately what that adds up to is the development of speed. Once you do something over and over and over and over again, eventually you can do it fast over and over and over again. And of course a lot of guys, especially guitar players, God knows, are tempted to shred, okay? So B.B. Uh, King, though, he, he really emphasized this part of it, the elocution, the making a statement. That's what blues is about anyway. It's about expressing yourself. So this should not be lost to these two. And in fact, these two go to support that, all right, the elocution. That's the prime thing. Now, 
to really drive the point home, let me talk, let's, all right, music is a form of expression. People often say music is a language. And I think literally it is a language. We just don't know the meanings of the words, all right? It's like we're hearing a language from another country that we never heard that, uh, we never heard spoken before. So let's, let's use the example of somebody who's giving a speech, an oration. Somebody that's overly developed in the coordination skill would be like the old auctioneers. He'd be talking at a million miles an hour like this, and I'd keep on going with that, no breath in between, and we'd just go on and on and on like that, and you'd be sitting in the audience bored to tears after about three minutes because you couldn't follow everything that was going on. Wouldn't you get bored? Now, uh, on the other side, somebody who's overly developed in theory is using four and five syllable words for that are displacing one and two syllable words that could have just as easily been used. Uh, that adds up to nothing short of pretension as far as I'm concerned. I once read a book by Igor Stravinsky, uh, Stravinsky called The Poetics of Music and literally, and I'm not kidding about this, I had a dictionary with me and every page I had to look up at least five words. I was By the end of the book, I wondered about that. Are you trying to kiss academia's ass to come off like you're just so highly intellectual? Um, now, if somebody is overdeveloped here, could you imagine going to a lecture with no dictionary on hand, and a guy is speaking, and every fifth or sixth word is some word you'd never heard before and would have to look up in a dictionary? All right. Let's say... Uh, Let's say, shall we perambulate around the environment with our canine, rather than should we walk the dog? All right, to me, should we walk the dog just says it. So that's my point. If you went to a lecture and somebody was speaking like that, believe me, you'd fall asleep after about five minutes, ten minutes. All right. Uh, Elocution, and this is why it's the top of the triangle. You get someone, a speaker like Martin Luther King, who appeals to your heart and your soul and your feelings. As far as I'm concerned, what's wrong with that? So musicians take heart. It doesn't, see a lot of musicians raise the bar so high for themselves. Well, this guy can do that, and that guy could do that, and I can't do that. Well, it doesn't matter. This here is your signature. This is who you are. So just express that. If you have a vocabulary of a thousand words and you go ahead and compose a haiku, the Japanese poetry form of five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables, very simple form of poetry, with uh, a vocabulary of a thousand words, you can come up with something quite beautiful and lovely. It's not impossible. Uh, if you had a vocabulary of 50,000 words, you can also come up with something quite beautiful, but now you have a little bit more flex room. You could add in more subtlety to the words you're using. However, just like walking the dog, oh, you can get your point across that way or perhaps with a bit more subtlety or specificity like uh, let's walk Max the green dog or whatever. Uh, point being that maybe you can add a few extra um, poetic elements to to the haiku, but basically you're saying the same thing either way. So really, ultimately, take heart. You're, you're doing, you're reaching people. That's the bottom line of all this. All right, unfortunately, I had to do an edit just now because I ran out of space on my disk. So uh, sorry about that. But uh, all right, so this is the triangle of musical excellence, coordination, theory, elocution. Now, you, any, any musician of any level will relate to this. If you're an advanced musician and you want to learn a new scale that you never played before for a certain situation, you learn the scale, you learn what the situations are that apply to that scale, and you learn to make a statement through using that scale. So beginners to advanced, this is, what, this is the map for your own progress, and do your best to pull all of these three points forward together. And what I mean to forward together is, of course, you have to take it in this order, but as soon, when you learn 
say a, a new scale or whatever, find out how to apply it. Once it's in your muscle memory, find out how to apply it and then use it in, in a uh, jamming or whatever you do to improvise. And then that's what I mean by pushing it forward together. You move from there to there, to there in a linear fashion, but your objective is to, to get to here using the force of all three together. I hope that kind of makes sense. In any case, thank you for checking this out, and uh, I'll be with you really soon with another installment. Um, you know, be warned, it will, it's going to get pretty dense. I'm, I will do my absolute best to make it as simple as possible so people can, can understand. Thank you very much. Vinny Caggiano, signing off. Have a good one.